All right, let's, uh, let's kick off here. Um, so we're in Acts chapter 8, uh, the second week thereof. Uh, for those who are not here last week, we covered the first eight verses, um, which primarily covered two broad things. Luke again zooming out to the macroscopic level um, and giving us the, the highlights um, of Saul uh, engaging in his warfare against the church. Uh, and his persecution thereof, um, and then the consequential or the resultant uh, diaspora, the scattering, as most of your translations will have, um, of the church in Jerusalem, or certainly the majority thereof, um, out into Samaria. Um, and so then now we've got some of those details, and, and Philip was primarily the one who was then uh, leading those Christians who are now dispersed out into, into Samaria. Um, and we got some details there, and there was much much joy in that city for the people being saved and converted and so on, and signs and wonders being done in confirmation of the gospel being preached. And so then now we move into the first of our two uh, kind of specific stories um, that finish off this chapter 8 here. And this week is in regards to a figure who is very briefly known here uh, throughout the New Testament, yet not briefly known at all. Uh, throughout the history of the church, in fact, very much known, uh, namely the one who we call in English Simon the Magician. So uh, I'll read to us from uh, verses 9 through to 25, which will be this morning's passage. We'll pray and then we'll commence our study from there. So, so Acts chapter 8, verses 9 to 25. There was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed... So, but when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip and seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands upon them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also so that anyone upon whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right with God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the bile of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, (laughs) preaching the gospel to to many villages of the Samaritans. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, to read them, to mark them, to learn them, and to inwardly digest them, in order that we may embrace and ever hold fast to the blessed hope in Jesus Christ. Amen. So, very interesting story and a very interesting account, uh, even by relative standards. Um, of this figure that we know in English as Simon the Magician, uh, the one who is uh, often referred to in Greek as Simon Homagos or Simon Magus in the Latin, um, as he was more commonly known throughout the history of the church. 
before we even begin to get into this into our actual explanation and the description here of, of who this guy is and what and what's what first perhaps a bit of uh, etymology regarding the word magician or the word magus in Latin or magos in, in, in Greek this is the same word uh, in all languages magician for us in English um, that you see come up at many other times throughout the scriptures. Uh, probably the most famous example, at least on a surface level, is, of course, the reference to the Magi, the Magi, who came and visited Jesus uh, at some point in the first two years after his birth. Um, contrary to the common perception, they weren't there on the night of the birth. Um, uh, they followed this star, and they were there some time before uh, Jesus and, and the Holy Family went off into Egypt. Right, to flee the Herodian persecution. Um, but either way, they're there when he was a baby at some point. So those uh, magi, and again, uh, it's usually uh, led with three by virtue of the three major gifts that are led, uh, spoken of there in the, in the Gospels. Um, we don't know how many magi there were. Uh, there were potentially many more than just three. Uh, and in fact, most likely, but either way, the number is not specifically given and so not much of a concern. But this is the same kind of person. In this case, Simon is not uh, a Magi from Persia, which is where those men were from, from the East, as they're often referred to, uh, who would have been Zoroastrian Magi, pagan magicians, um, which is what's so fascinating about that, about that story and, that, and the reality of these pagan magicians recognizing the signs in the heavens um, and coming and, and paying homage and worshiping Jesus as God um, and as King. Um, that's another story. And so magician is this same kind of uh, concept, this same kind of person. Now, we'll get into some details in, in a moment about the actual, what's being meant here by magic. Um, so we'll begin with our reading and then we'll cover that as we go through. So have a look at verse nine. There was a man named Simon, nothing particular about that name, the very common name in, the, in those days who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him, in verse 10, from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. Now, a number of things here. The first thing that, that I want to highlight for us, which will kind of just influence the background reading of how we actually read a passage like this, is that despite modern notions, at no point will you actually find throughout the scriptures the kind of description that would seem to indicate that those like this figure we have before us, Simon, or many others before him, uh, you know, the magicians of Egypt who encountered or who fought against uh, Moses, um, particularly in the encounter, uh, I think to Exodus chapter 8, I believe, uh, somewhere in there, maybe chapter 5, uh, regarding the battle of the serpents um, at no point will you actually find the scriptures state that the magic isn't real that the magicians are not actually doing supernatural things that they're just kind of like modern magicians who are doing sleight of hand tricks um, very cleverly um, there's no indication like that at all throughout the scriptures that the power that they're using isn't real and that they're not actually doing magical things what we probably call magical things or just supernatural things generically. Um, why do I bother pointing this out? It, because it actually informs our exegesis of why interaction with employment of utilization of magic is an abomination and is expressly forbidden and outlawed by God. Um, it is not merely um, God outlawing the use of magic in all its various forms simply because, oh, that's a waste of time and you'll just go down a, a, fool's, a fool's errand, right? That's not necessarily untrue, it is a fool's errand, but it's not a fool's errand by virtue of the fact that it's all completely fake and you would be wasting your time and devoting to something that isn't real, right? Even though just generically that would be good enough reason for it to be outlawed. It's outlawed specifically because it is real and it's outlawed specifically because it is real power that has very real consequences and that comes from very real sources that are also very, really powerful and so then should therefore be very, really avoided. <laughs> That's why, okay? 
It's by virtue of the fact that such powers, we are told, come expressly and explicitly and exclusively from dark sources. Uh, there is no uh, distinction, as is the case in most uh, neo-pagan circles, particularly that of Wicca, of a distinction between white and black magic, as they would refer to in their doctrine. Uh, white magic being referred to as magic that is uh, used for good purposes, for beneficial purposes, uh, and magic, black magic that is used for dark, nefarious purposes. Um, the the neo-pagan perspective on magic uh, is not only biblically incorrect, uh, it's generally speaking historically incorrect, at least to a certain degree, um, compared to actual people of antiquity who practice magic. Um, it is also not just simply a generic force that can either be like a tool like anything else that can be used for good or for evil. Um, we're expressly told that it is by definition an evil power that comes from evil sources and is in every interaction of employment evil. Um, it doesn't matter whether the consequences are on a surface level good. Right? So let's just say hypothetically, hypothetically, um, you had scenarios which 100% occurred in ancient times um, where you would have someone who was badly wounded or injured from battle, say, and they would be brought before the king's magicians to be healed, right? And healing would occur. Um, their leg would be, whatever the issue is, they would be fixed and all honky dory. On the surface, you go, well, that's a good thing. You know, it's not like, you know, they've had magic employed so they can now have demonic powers in order to heal a leg. It's power being used to heal a leg that is A, coming from dark sources. We're expressly told that it comes from dark sources. It does not come from good sources or lightful sources. It comes from dark, evil sources. And secondly, it's operating inherently in a system that itself is dark and demonic, an expressly pagan society, an expressly pagan culture and context. Yep. You raise a very uncomfortable subject for Christians. Can be sometimes, yeah. Because it seems to me there are many, many Christians who simply don't believe this account that there was magic being practiced. Yeah, they can take, they can kind of tend to, sometimes people can tend to default to a modern naturalistic, materialistic view of things like that, yeah. What I'm really saying is that there are a lot of Christians who haven't thought about this. Mm. Mm. What I'm really saying is that they haven't thought about the spiritual realm deeply enough. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the balance. Um, is that again, like a lot of things, balance. Um, you have yes, you, you you have to avoid the modern the modern Christian has to avoid one of two extremes, um, one of two kind of divergences from orthodoxy. The first of which, in no particular order, but one of one of which is a the allowance of modern, atheistic, materialistic, naturalistic, Darwinian, secular thought to start to frame their worldview about how the world actually is, about reality, right? Um, and that happens quite a lot. You also have the other side of that spectrum, the other pendulum swing, which is the focusing on, to one degree or another, sometimes to an absolute obsession, sometimes even just to, uh, focused in general upon acquiring miraculous gifts, speaking in tongues, mm -hmm. getting an apostolic power to heal, uh, and a thousand other things that come with that that is inherently what the Pentecostal and charismatic movement is, that is bordering into things that they are not prepared for. Mm -hmm. um, you go, when you go to the real headquarters of, 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 of the modern charismatic movement, places like Bethel Church in Reading, California, in the USA, uh, the National House of Prayer in, in Kansas, USA, and a, a number of places, places here as well. Um, the things that they engage in are, by every possible historical definition, occultic. Um, the ways in which they measure the movements of God are, by every definition, Gnostic and occultic. Um, uh, uh, you know, you'll hear pastors talking about how they have secret languages with God. Mm. about how they have, about how they, in order to acquire the, the blessing and the apostolic power of, 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 of a pastor who's died, they'll go and engage in what's called grave soaking, which is where they'll lay upon the grave of the dead. 
figure in order to receive power. Yes. Yeah. who pre yeah. preceded him. Yeah. And you've got all these so millions of so-called Christians following him. Yep. A, an avowed magician. Yeah, correct. Yep. Yep. Um, and, and what they're doing there is, is nothing, you know, uh, you know, Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry, which is the single biggest charismatic, uh, like school, school of ministry, I use inverted commas, in the charismatic movement. Uh, they've, they would have had tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of students go through there by now. Um, where you're going there specifically learning how to acquire and use the apostolic miraculous slash miraculous gifts, as if that's quite literally not by definition a school, a school of magic. When we boil it all down, what we're really talking about is the forces and powers of Satan yep. and his, his princes and powers, principalities. I, I understand there was a um, poll done of even professing evangelical Christians in America, and uh, some, I don't remember the proportion, but it was a high proportion, it may have even been over 50%, mm -hmm. who do not believe Satan is a real spiritual being. Oh yeah, if you, you, can, you, can, find fairly, you can find fairly reputable, uh, not, not, the vast majority of studies that, or sorry, not studies, polls that people ever do aren't really not worth the salt that they're of anything, they're not worth the paper they're written on, to be frank. But, but some of them, though, if, if you get a good sample size, it's a diverse sample size, you can actually get some pretty reasonable results from things. And even among those ones that are done reasonably well, like polls like that that are done with a wide population group, diverse population groups, so you're not just like one specific focus group, um, you will still get figures that come out like that. Yeah, shocking, mm -hmm. shocking, shocking, shocking results. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because that's, the, that's, that's, that's those who have allowed uh, the the, the non-Christian culture in which they reside to start to influence their own biblical theology mm. in one direction or another, like uh, in all kinds of cases. And that's right. an indictment on the pulpits, the modern pulpits. Uh, ex the explicit, expressly and directly, correct. As, as Simon the Magician is just one example, mm -hmm. um, you know, it says in Leviticus, the, the, that one who practices sorcery will be, surely be put to death. Yeah, correct. The, the pulpits are failing to preach sin. Mm, if yeah. that's a sin, that's one of the yeah, expressly so. Yeah. Hundreds of sins. Yeah, correct. Yeah, exactly. And it's and it's and the pro the prohibitions against the employment and usage of magic are uh, multitudinous. But they are, they're not just merely because that's what I'm trying to highlight. It's not just merely because. Uh, Oh, it's not real, and so therefore you would be pursuing something that's unreal. That, as a concept, is not necessarily untrue, but that doesn't apply here when it comes to magic. Because the issue is, a, it's very much real, uh, and b, you'll very much get what you're looking for, and b, you're going to regret it. It has such sorry, man. It has such fundamental and immediate implications for everyone in this room and everyone listening later, mm. because everyone in this room one way or another, has given over, given themselves over, consented to at one stage in their lives or another, to superstition um, and, and beyond. Yeah, certainly at some point or another, um, for sure. Magic. Yeah. And you know who you are in this room, and oh, I know that I was one of them. Yeah, exactly. And, um, yeah, you know, well, yeah. And, and this has very serious and fundamental implications for one's walk with Christ. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You want to jump I was just going to say, with laying on hands and that, is that something you should just stay away from? No, no. So the laying on of hands, the laying on of hands, and that becomes something we'll discuss here in a second. But the laying on of hands has a different biblical implication, um, very much so. And again, because the distinction needs to be made between what they're doing here versus what's then later described by Paul in regards to laying on of hands, because they're two very different things, and we're very clearly indicated the two very different things. What goes on here and then what goes on by the time you're now decades later, even just decades later, as to what's going on. Um, and so we'll cover that, we'll cover that in a minute because that comes up obviously in the latter mm -hmm. half of that church, of that portion there. Um, but yes, so the, the, point, the point, just the very broad point about magic is not that it is unreal. No, it very much is real. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that that, oh, it's just a fool's errand because there's no actual power in it. No, no, there very much is. Um, Paul explains that the gods, lowercase g plural, the, the gods are not actually gods, okay, the old gods, um, are not actually divine in the sense that God is divine at all, B, 
but at no point does he actually deny that they're real figures. In fact, he actually says the opposite. He says they very much are, and he especially identifies them as demonic entities, as demonic forces. Right? Um, so those, to use their context here, not so much the Samaritans, but the, the Greeks um, of the first century, the, the Zeus was very much a real figure. Hades was very much a real figure. Poseidon was a real figure. Athena was a very real figure. Artemis, Apollo, Hermes, go through the list. They were real figures. They were real entities. They were not gods. They were not divine beings. Mm -hmm. They were demonic beings. Mm -hmm. They were fallen angels. They were demons. They were insert a number of different words that can be used there. Um, I mean, even the word, the word that we get for demon in English comes from daemon in the Greek, which just is a very generic term meaning a divine or supernatural entity. Um, and so the demons are the ones being worshipped there. Um, and that goes for every single cultural context. It goes for the Egyptians, it goes for the Assyrians, it goes for the Babylonians, the Persians, the Canaanites. That's why you can find so much commonality. That's why you can find that although the peripheral details will be different, some of the mythological stories might be different in their specific details, the pantheon, right, the, the, the group of gods in Egypt, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, even the Norse, so on and so forth. Their deities, their figures, all have equivalents. Do you understand? Um, and they have very similar stories in the broad categorical details because it's the same entities that are worshipped in Egypt, that are worshipped in Babylon, that are worshipped in Persia, Greece, Rome, Germania, etc. Do you know what I mean? Um, and so it's by virtue of that reason. And, and, the, and the real big, the, the, where the kind of rubber hits the roads on the, on the magic stuff is a, part, a big reason why there's a commandment against it is because you will be used, misused and abused by the forces that you're playing with. Um, uh, there is no spirit, demon, et cetera, et cetera, entity, whatever you like to refer to them as, that cares about you, um, uh, that gives even a tinker's cuss about anything to do with you um, every one of them hate you and their express goal is to destroy your life and to make it as miserable as possible. Mm. That is the point, right? It is destruction. Um, so that's why the concept of white magic is biblically, by, by biblical standards, a myth. There is no such thing as magic purely being just a tool that is neutral and is then either used for good or used for evil. That paradigm is completely false according to what we get throughout the scriptures. Does that, does that make sense? Um, Tell that to all the uh, 12 and 13 year old girls who just come out of Halloween mm. trying to cast spells on their friends exactly. at school and the yeah, is, I know. Yeah. It's, it's, just, it's like we see it. I know with Haddle Road, on, I just locked the door and locked the gate and I just thought, right, shut the blind. <laughs> like I just, you know, was at home. Yeah. yeah. It's just the, sort of, yeah. you know, it's just. Um, yeah, and the issue is. Yeah. It is, yeah. and, but the amount of people that are just up and down the road, you think, oh, this is terrible. Yeah, and the issue, the, the issue is that the only, well, it's taking its ugliest form in Australia. It's a very brief aside about Halloween, since it got mentioned. It's taking, a very, it's, taking its ugliest possible form uh, in Australia because we do not have a historical connection. Mm. Well, we do, but we, we don't, uh, pragmatically speaking. We technically do by virtue of our Christian heritage, but we don't, unfortunately, in our practice. Um, we don't have a connection to All Hallows' Eve and to All Saints' Day, um, yeah. which we, yeah. we should, but we unfortunately don't, um, uh, which has been a day that, again, I won't get into the history of, of, of Halloween. It, it is, if you can ask me it afterwards, after the study. Uh, we can go into it in question time if you want. Um, but yeah, it's taking its ugliest forms in Australia, which is completely disconnected from the religious aspect, and then mildly influenced by a different religious aspect, namely that of neo-paganism. Um, yet it's still complete, it's still for the large part, a commercialized waste of time. <laughs> um, and so yeah, let me continue with this. Um, so understand here too, by the way, again, si Simon is legitimately practicing magic, doing very real miracles that people can very really see with their very real eyes, okay? Um, and so the Samaritans referred to him as great. Um, uh, again, verse 10, you'll see that this man is the power of God that is called great. Um, and th that's an interesting phrasing there in the Greek, but essentially what they're saying, not necessarily saying he is God. They are in one sense saying he's God-like though. 
um, and that kind of comes across in, in the Greek a bit better. Um, but this man is the power of God that is called great, uh, Megale. Um, uh, you also do actually have evidence, not just here from this scripture, but also broadly more historically from Josephus and others um, and some of the early church historians and early church fathers that he was essentially treated and almost quasi-worshipped as a god in Samaria. Um, so there very much was a divine aspect to his, uh, essentially the quasi-cult that developed around Simon the Magician, um, where he was treated as a god. Um, and treated essentially as the power, the power, the definite article power of God. And so in verse 11, uh, and they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. Again, none of this language leads you to indicate that it was all just a fugazi. It was just a mirage. It was just, it was just a sleight of hand where he was, you know, pulling a rabbit out of his hat. Like it's not, you know, this is very real power. Okay. And he's amazing them with it because, well, it's pretty amazing. And so in verse 12, but when they, is in referring to the Samaritans, but when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news, that is the, the gospel, right, the Evangelion, when he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. All right, so people start converting after seeing Philip and hearing the gospel preached. Right? And that's why in verse 13 we find that even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued along with Philip, and seeing signs and great miracles, um, you could also translate that kind of great power, right? great acts of power or demonstrations of power, right? signs and great miracles or great powers performed, he was amazed. Right? So even Simon himself, this magician, was amazed by the power of God that was actually being worked through Philip. <laughs> um, and the signs of wonders that were going forth and accompanying the message. Um, what's interesting, though, is note, notice what's... This is not a mistake on Luke's part. Right? This, is very, this is very intentional. Notice between verses 12 and 13, which go together, right? Because um, you'll have, but when they, right? So it's showing contradistinction between the verses that came forth. Notice what's led with. Are the miraculous signs and wonders leading or is it the preaching of the gospel that is led? What comes first in that ordering? In verse 12, it's the gospel. Preaching. Right? Preaching. What this means, and again, this is not the only, this, this is just one of many examples of this same concept throughout not just the book of Acts, but throughout the New Testament broadly. The, the miraculous signs and the wonders that came during this age were at the most an auxiliary accompaniment to the preaching, to the gospel, right? To the preaching of the good news. Okay, they were never the point. They were never the central focus. This is where charismatics and Pentecostals go off the rail. Mm -hmm. Okay, because the because the miracles and the endless, relentless pursuit of miraculous powers is the be all and the end all. It's the central focus. It's the beginning and the end. It is the focus. That's why you will have charismatic evangelists going out into the shopping mall, into public places, literally to only do one thing, only to do miracles, like only to heal people, only to give a prophetic word, only to pull the, yeah, only to pull the complete fugazi trick of lengthening legs um, and, and all, the thousand different, all the thousand different little tricks that they have, all right? Well, they just do that, just go out and heal. Well, you're not, you're not obeying the biblical pattern that's not the way it's done at all. You're going out and healing someone's leg, if we just pretend for a second that's what happens, that's nothing. Because you healed their leg as they limp off to hell. What have you done? Nothing. Um, I'm not saying they never engage in gospel evangelism, as far as they would define it. I'm not saying that never occurs. Um, but it takes a back seat. And anyone who spends any length of time in a dedicated charismatic church that actually believes what they, what they profess to believe you'll notice the gospel takes the back seat of the bus. This is an amazing passage on so many levels. Absolutely. Very true. Yeah. Because it's not just about the miracles. Yeah. It's about the preaching of the gospel. Yeah. And it's the preaching of the gospel. 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 It's the preaching of the gosp
God. Yeah, they're on the tra- they're on the train. Yeah, hundred percent. It says again. It's I think it says twice um, that um, Simon was practicing magic arts, and then yep. it says again that he was uh, amazing them with his magic arts. Yeah. We're told that the people were following him. We're told that for a long time he had amazed time. them. Right. Oh yeah. And then in verse twelve, it says it, it's almost casual. It says, but when they believed in Philip's preaching, are you kidding me? They had gone from, say, decades or lifetimes of believing in For sure, yeah. And then suddenly they believed in Philip's preaching. What caused that, ladies and gentlemen? The Holy Spirit caused it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. That is, in other words, what this passage is saying to us hmm. is that the Holy Spirit is, be, uh, is powerful beyond human understanding. Correct, yeah. And it's also telling us in other in the, in the Gospels that when the demons saw Jesus from afar, they fell down and said, yeah. oh, Son of God, what have you to do with us? Yeah, what are you doing here? Yeah. You know? So what it's really telling us here is that there is nothing to compare with the power of God. Correct, yeah. And another point that's also broader it's in, it's in, it's it's implied here when you can take it in consideration with other areas of scripture um is that the is that notions of people being able to resist the effectual calling of the spirit of god unto salvation mm-hmm. is just not true um by ver- what i mean by that is is that when the spirit of god actually moves in a person's heart and mind to save them mm-hmm. they get saved Right? The idea that people can resist the salvific will of the Spirit, but again, but when you read the rest of the Council of Scripture and then see it pragmatically applied here, is just not true. Well, that's not right? the Bible. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Taking to people who have been, who have been f- how would you like to call it, followers of the magical arts for decades, as you point out, years and decades, and then like that transformed, that defines... And, and demonstrates quite clearly the sovereign, or sorry, the sovereignty of the will of God I over issues like salvation. I've known such people, they were beyond uh, magicians, they were Satan, self avowed Satanists. Sure, yeah, exactly. And, and then the Holy Spirit of God converted them. Yeah, correct, yeah. People in this room probably know such souls. Yeah, absolutely. If you, if you don't know and you're interested, just get on YouTube, there are thousands of such testimonies. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so that's 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 evidentialized through this kind of what we're in. Unforgivable sin is to not respond to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. The Holy Spirit has this power. Yeah. And the the Holy Spirit Himself doesn't want you to reject Him. Correct. Yes. And and yeah, exactly. And I mean, the unforgivable sin that's described has been something of of long-standing debate, but it has to be read. Not just in its own literary context, but it has to be read in consultation with the rest of Scripture, right? Scripture interpreting Scripture. And so you read the areas of Scripture that are clear on issues like sin and soteriology, right? Salvation. Mm -hmm. And then you take passages that are on a surface level more difficult, right? And you interpret them in light of the clear passages. Not the other way around. Like you can't take, don't, (laughs) hermeneutics 101 is don't take the more complex passages and try and figure that out and then interpret the clear passages in light of the more complex. Mm. Take the clear passages and use that as the framework mm. through which to understand the more complex. And so when you read... Draws, yeah, fun, exactly. He draws... He, at, no, at, at all points across regeneration, we're told this is the action of God. Even the faith that you have is, is described as a gift. Right? Mm. It's not something you generate in yourself. It's not... You making a decision in the sense that somehow disconnected from God, you've made a decision to believe Him. It's that's all your decision. What you on a, what we on a mortal level would identify as, I now follow Christ. That is within the framework of the sovereignty of God over that entire event in the first place. That's what's described there. So then we that's how we understand the unforgivable the unforgivable sin is the rejection of God, i.e., not a Christian. That's the category that eventually will be judged. It's, it's fairly straightforward when you interpret it in light of the actual passages that we get on soteriology. Yeah. So, these people convert, right? Now, pointing out something here, because this informs how we understand this entire figure, right? In verse 13, we, we, it says, Simon himself believed. Yeah. Now, on the surface level, we're going to get into what that, how that plays out. Because um, if you just read verse 13, 
you'll draw a conclusion that the passage itself is not drawn. Um, what's interesting is that the word pistuon, uh, right, in its particular form here being, um, let me find exactly where it is. That's the name. Uh, yeah, epistuon, so the, in the active verse, so he believed, right, in that sense, having past tense, he believed, um, uh, is used. Um, if you just read that singular verse, because he's also baptized, you'll notice, right? We're told he believes and he's baptized. Now, again, if you just read that word in isolation, if you just read that sentence in isolation, you'll draw a conclusion that the text is not drawing itself. So bookmark that, sen that sentence as we keep reading, okay? In verse 14, we get the following. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, right? So they call in reinforcements, mm -hmm. um, uh, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Um, one little tidbit, by the way, um, uh, not of great importance, but important enough to worth mentioning it. Um, it also occurred actually earlier on in this, in this back up in verse five, about Philip going down to the city of Samaria. Um, sometimes uh, uh, the enemies of the church will highlight uh, words like going down to Samaria from Jerusalem and go, see, they got the geography completely wrong because Samaria is north of Jerusalem, mm -hmm. except they don't understand the fact that in the first century, everywhere was considered down from Jerusalem. It's a Hebraism, it's a Hebraism correct, yes. Mm -hmm. Jerusalem is up on a hill. It's on a mount, on a, not a mountain like we're on a mountain, but it's on a hill, right? Um, and so you physically actually go down when you exit Jerusalem, going wherever you're going to go. So everywhere was essentially referred to as going down from Jerusalem. It's a Hebraism. Yeah, it's almost like going down to Sydney. Yeah, correct. Or I'm going to go, like there'll be people who are saying, oh, I'm going down to Gosford. Yes. Okay. Yeah, right. Gos Gosford is geographically north of where we are right here. That's right. Okay, but going down the mountain yes. to Gosford. Yeah, people refer to going up to Canberra, and they refer to that even if they're up in Sydney, they're going up to Canberra, right? It happens for those kinds of reasons, yeah. And so, and so that's, the, that's what's going on here. Um, just as a brief aside, because sometimes I've had very few people ever ask me that, um, usually really, really attentive grammarian. Um, uh, but that's why it's said that way, it's a Hebrewism. Um, so it's not, it's not Luke not knowing the difference between north and south. Anyway, um, so when they, that Jerusalem gone down, da, 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 um, and verse 15, and who came down and prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Um, for he had not yet fallen upon any of them. Uh, sorry, yes, before he, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, again, when you read passages like this in isolation and use them as proof texts, you draw conclusions that the rest of the New Testament does not draw. There are a couple of things here. So this is a fa this is a massively favourite uh, text or proof text used by charismatics for this concept that is inherent to Pentecostalism and, charis and the charismatic movement, known as the second baptism or the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the baptism of fire. And there's a couple of different names they use for it. Um, Pentecostal and charismatic doctrine for you know 120 years now. Uh, has been that there are two different baptisms that occur. There is a baptism wherein the person is saved and regenerated, mm. where they are, where the Spirit of God dwells in them, right? Emphasis on the word dwells. But then there is a second baptism that then must occur secondarily beyond that point called the filling of the Holy Spirit. So dwelling versus filling. Um, and that, so you, you are a Christian and that, that, that wasn't originally their doctrine. It then it developed out of necessity almost. But anyway, um, very quickly. But a Christian is one who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit, right? They've been born again, to use that, that terminology. Um, but then there's this secondary event in Pentecostal and Charismatic doctrine that holds that this additional experience of the Holy Spirit called filling of the Holy Spirit um, can and must and should occur, and you should want that as a Christian, and that's evidenced by a number of things, but it's fundamentally identified by the ability to speak in tongues. Um, and that would all be great, 
if it weren't entirely false. Um, like a lot of things. With a lot of things, it would be really nice to believe if they weren't complete hogwash. Um, you'll find not one single evidence of that when you actually consider this subject um, called pneumatology, right, the study of the Holy Spirit, um, throughout the scriptures. Um, and when you actually read these passages in broader context of the whole counsel of God, you then understand what's actually being said. Um, those conclusions that had been drawn in the early 1900s, kind of between 1901 and 1907, um, were conclusions that were drawn completely in contradistinction to what literally every Christian had ever believed going back 1900 years. Uh, when you start believing new things that people haven't believed for 1,900 years, um, it's generally not a good spot to find yourself in um, and you'd probably reconsider your opinion. Uh, that oh no, I wouldn't dare have a go at John Nelson Dubb. Um, uh, and by wouldn't, I mean very much, I mean very much would, unfortunately. Um, anyway, getting back to the point here. Um, let me read the full context of the verses and then we'll actually jump into what's being said. Okay. So going back to verse 14, just to give the broader context. The apostles of Jerusalem, they hear that Samaria has received the word of God. They send down Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 17. Then they laid their hands upon them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a couple of things here. One, what you won't find in this passage is any possible connection to there having been two miraculous events of the Holy Spirit dwelling in and then secondarily and detached from that, filling. Mm. There's no description of there being two events here. Mm. Mm. Secondly, you find zero descriptions given that miraculous gifts at all, at le at le least of which specifically speaking in tongues, is somehow connected to being filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Right? So when Pentecostals and Charismatics try to proof text this particular passage, the amount of things that are then tacked on top and read into these words is almost endless, right? Because what happens, what you have to do when you come up with false doctrine is you have to eisegete. You have to take what you've already decided is true and then read it into the passage so that when you read certain words, you go, aha, see? No, I don't see because it doesn't say that. <laughs> you see that because you've already decided what's what up here. And so then when you read it, you read certain words that you've already decided mean certain things. Do you see how that works? Not reading the actual words, engaging in the hermeneutics, particularly in this case, in engaging with the Greek, and then extracting the meaning out of that and letting this dis determine what the view is, not the other way around. Okay? Um, we're not told that there's some connection with miraculous gifts that are associated with even a first interaction with the Holy Spirit, let alone a supposed second, of which there isn't even a mentioning of some second here in the first place. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. What we do have, right, is that they had not received at this particular point the kind of dynamic, life-changing fulfillment of the Spirit of God in, their, in, their, in what they're doing, right? In, so in their being, in their heart, right? That's why we see the apostles coming, laying on of hands, and conversion occurring. At no point, by the way, are we ever even explicitly told in this passage or another that the, that the apostles say have, are the ones who have the power to actually like command the Holy Spirit. You will get that if that's the framework through which you're going to interpret it. Mm. The laying on of hands and then the Holy Spirit comes. But again, at no point is that actually a doctrinal statement at all, that they're the ones commanding the Holy Spirit's actions. It's describing events. The humility of what is taking place here is told to us before mm. they go down and lay hands, they pray to the Lord. Yes. In, um, yeah. in verse 15. Yeah. Um, prayed on their behalf to the end that they yes. would take the Holy Spirit. What they were in fact saying is, that we got on our knees and said, Lord, um, please 
please send your Holy Spirit upon the Samaritans yes. because they're seeking you. Yes. Mm. Yeah. And that's humility. It's yeah. got nothing to do with, with charismatic, charismatic gifts. Charismatic gifts, exactly. Yeah. And, that's, that's on, and, that's, and so this is an important... The reason why I'm highlighting this is not just like to swing a sledgehammer. It's, it's to try and give practical examples of why biblical hermeneutics are so important, right? About why the actual ta- the, the taking of time and care for how to actually interpret and exegete the scriptures is so important to what you end up believing doctrinally, okay? It requires work, yes. It requires effort, yes. It requires study, yes. But it's for a reason. It's for the purpose of you not believing things that are false, right? If people care about truth, it shouldn't matter what your opinions are about what's said here, right? It, the, the, I, 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 don't, I don't draw the... I'm not saying the things that I'm saying and drawing conclusions that I'm drawing because I have some imbalanced aversion or hatred for charismatic people or for such and such an idea. I have no emotional disposition one way or the other toward the concept of miraculous gifts, like that you said the, the apostles are doing, right? Mm. It's not like I'm sitting here with some emotional aversion of going, oh, I don't like that they did that. And so then I'm drawing conclusions that are trying to suit my own emotional perspective. I could not feel more neutrally about the subject. What I do care about is what does this actually say, right? And so when you approach it from that perspective, you realize that well, it's not because of an irrational hatred. It's not because I'm emotionally biased. No, it's because I care about what this says. And if it says what this says, and you actually apply sound hermeneutics, and you can demonstrate that you're, you're using sound hermeneutics, right? Because one thing to claim it, it's another thing to actually do it, right? But you can demonstrate that you're using sound hermeneutics. It doesn't matter what you feel about the text. It doesn't matter what you feel about the subject you should value what God has said. In fact, if anything, what it's doing is highlighting the necessity and the power of prayer. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, if, if, if anything, yeah, good point. Yeah, exactly right. Um, the other part too, that's also worth considering in, in all of this, is that, and it's not so much a thing, well, it is a thing here, there are even greater examples of where it's even more applicable, is that one of the, one of the most fundamental issues that comes up today in hermeneutics and in biblical interpretation is the failure to distinguish between what's called narrative and normative. Okay? What do those two words mean? Narrative, right, story, the events described, right? These are the things we get in the Acts of the Apostles or in the four Gospels, right, which are written as historical narrative or other areas of scripture, right? The uh, first and second uh, account of the kings, first and second chronicles of the kings, so on and so forth, right? Exodus, the book of Exodus, uh, Genesis, same, same deal. Um, the various areas of the, of the Bible throughout and other books as well that are using historical narrative as a genre um, and you're getting actual history, right? You have to distinguish between things that are narrative, things that are described in that narrative account, in that historical narrative as having occurred in time and history versus what is expected biblically as being normative for, the, for Christians, for the church, for the people of God, etc. Okay? Um, a really obvious and clear example is Jesus walking on water. Okay? And that event where he calms the storm and the interaction with Peter and so on and so forth. You have those, and Charismatics and Pentecostals are the apex of this, but there are others beyond that as well, right? who read that and go... Well, see, that's in the Bible. Jesus did it. I follow Jesus. Peter also, for half a second, did it. (laughs) Um, uh, Peter's not God. He's a follower of Jesus, just like me. And it's all in the Bible. Therefore, that must be what should happen. That is absolutely incorrect. That's narrative. Jesus turning water into wine. Narrative. You know what else is narrative? Jesus dying on the cross. Jesus being buried. Jesus being risen from the dead. That's narrative. That's where you get into other areas that, again, the Roman Catholics, not that they would refer to it this way, but incidentally they are doing the same, they're committing the same thing. Right? Every time when they re-sacrifice Christ in the Mass, which is what's occurring, they're confusing normative for narrative. Not that they would frame it that way, but 
what they're doing. Um, you're confusing normative for narrative, right? And so what's narrative, or in this case, narrative for normative, right? Taking something that is described in the scriptures and then assuming that's the normal pattern of how things are normally meant to occur in normal life, just generally and every day. That's not the case. It's, 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 it violates just hermeneutics 101, okay? And so when you see the apostles doing miracles, you should not automatically draw the conclusion, oh, that must mean that that's the normal pattern of operation for the church across time. You shouldn't do that. Because again, you can see from the Old Testament that that's not true. We see miraculous gifts clustered around Moses slash Aaron slash Joshua, and then they go away. We then see another cluster around Elijah or Elisha, and then they go away. And then they come back here. And then, by every record of churches that we have, they go away. So you can't confuse normative for narrative and narrative for normative. Right? That's a fundamental principle of hermeneutics. And you have to be able to employ sound hermeneutics to distinguish between what's normative and narrative. Okay? Same thing would go here generically. So even someone trying to quote this passage as supposed evidence that of any kind of charismatic claim has to mount the big problem of the distinction between normative and narrative in the first place, which it can't. I'll leave it at that. So, in verse 18, we just start to where we get to shift back to Simon now. Right? Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money. <laughs> um, again, I, I, I know I just mentioned it, but again, committing the same mistake between not distinguishing between normative and narrative because ironically what Simon's doing here is exactly what charismatics are doing is assuming that he just saw this happen oh that must be how it's normally meant to occur I can do that too <laughs> that's the same error except he's offering money here right but he offers them money that's the main focus right um, he offers them money saying give me this power also so that any upon, anyone upon whom I lay my hands may also receive the Holy Spirit Again, he's confusing what's going on here. For starters, he isn't understanding what's going on here. He's just looking at the surface level of they put their hands on them, they got Holy Spirit. Ergo, if I put my hands on, people can also get Holy Spirit. Again, it's, the same, it's literally the same fundamental error that, that occurs in the charismatic movement. Um, but the focus here is on him, him offering the money for this. Right? Uh, it's where we get, it's not often used these days, um, it's where we get the word simony from. Uh, simony is the is the uh, what it was always throughout the history of the church, and I suppose technically still is uh, a, a crime against the church. Um, uh, it's the offering, in simple terms, it's the offering of money for just to use a super generic term, religious things, right? Religious offices, right? Like the ministerial office, uh, religious uh, wealth, religious power, religious artifacts, religious items, right? Um, so when I say items, I don't mean like, you know, buying a Bible from a bookstore. I mean like offering money in exchange for holy and sacred things, right? Um, it's called simony, right? And is named after Simon, right? Simony. Um, and it was always a massive issue uh, that came up at certain points throughout the church. Uh, the 9th the and the 10th century, um, simony became a humongous problem, um, where it almost became, you, you would, should I use the word? Yeah, I think it's fair. You could, you could more or less, certainly throughout most of Western Christendom, describe simony as having been commonplace. Um, I won't define literally what commonplace might mean as a percentage, that would be impossible, but I would describe it in all fairness as commonplace um, in the ninth and 10th centuries of people offering money for religious positions like offices, religious artifacts, relics, things like this. Um, uh, and so it became a real problem in the 19th and 10th centuries um, that got cleaned up heavily in, in, the, in the Reformation. I mean, the, the, the most overt example of simony um, is indulgences. indulgences. Yeah, um, is indulgences, the issue of indulgences. Again, we've just, had, we've just had Reformation Day on the 31st and we've, and we've just had that, uh, our Reformation Sunday service, obviously just a couple of days ago. Um, the, the, the linchpin for Luther in terms of the pragmatic, on the pragmatic side, not just not necessarily the theological academic side, but on the pragmatic side, was the, was the special indulgence that was going around the Holy Roman Empire in, the, in those days, right around, you know, 
five thirteen to five sorry fifteen thirteen to fifteen seventeen um, uh, spearheaded by uh, Johann Tetzel in his particular area of of the Holy Roman Empire um, a special indulgence that would be paid quite a considerable sum that would get uh, that would get your relative out of purgatory immediately, which was ne which had never happened before. Uh, indulgences, if and when they had occurred, would be redu reduction of time, right? Reduction of sentences, not not a complete. Uh, yeah, spring. Yeah, get out of jail free. Yeah, so that's why, and so that's why, uh, the the kind of uh, the 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 proper the, the campaign motto that developed was. Um, you can translate it a couple of, we're not sure how to translate it, but um, there's a couple of different wordings, but something to the effect of in English, um, when the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs, yeah. as in springs out yeah. and release. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that, and that's, that kind of practice still goes on. Yeah, exactly. And so, and so that kind of thing still occurs in those kinds of fashions, not the specific one, but those kinds of indulgences. And so indulgence is a form of simony. Even though it was rationalized, even though it was completely rationalized as somehow not being simony, but yeah. Not forgetting the purchase of the papacy by certain popes. Oh yeah, oh exactly, yeah. The Medici, the Medici family in medieval Europe, late medieval Europe, this I know its name won't mean much to you, but the Medici family, uh, who were, I believe, either Genoese or Venetian. Either Genoese or Venetian, I think. Um, anyway. Um, Ah, oh, they were Florentines. Yes, good point. Yes, they were Florentines. I was literally on the verge of saying maybe they were Florentines. Um, yes, they were Florentines. Um, very, very powerful family um, that was involved in uh, in merchant trade, in law, in economics, and particularly in in civil government and in papacy. I mean, the Medici family had multiple popes put on the throne, multiple popes, um, and were corrupt to high heaven. Um, and so that kind of that's what simony is. So um, him offering money here is the main is the main primary issue. Him him essentially offering to pay money to bribe to somehow be able to purchase the power of God. Um, and so which is very fitting of that worldview of how magic can be occur, how magic can occur. <laughs> uh, it's very much in keeping with the old pagan pagan notion, just very broadly of if I do X given ritual, I will receive. X why given benefit from the gods that's the broad framework so in verse 20 um uh, he gets a proverbial punch in the face here on the part of peter um and so peter says to him but peter said to him may your silver perish with you right, may it die with you um because you thought you could obtain the gift of god with money um the again I know when we read things in english things aren't able to really come across all that heavily sometimes. Um, understand here that, I'm just get drawing it up here one sec. A bit too far. Yeah, I, I, P Peter's yelling at him here. Like Peter, Peter is livid. He's angry, really angry. Um, you get that in some of the ways that the, that it's, that the, the Greek constructs itself in that sentence syntactically, um, that gives us the evidence that he's actually yelling here. Does anyone's translation in English have an exclamation mark at the end of that sentence? Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, with God with money, exclamation mark. Yeah, that's what, it, yes, yes, yes. Okay, the ESV does. Um, and so other trans, other translations have that too. Yeah, that's what it's trying to indicate. Um, we tend to emphasize things with exclamation marks, which is where someone's yelling or making an emphatic point. Um, so that's what he's doing here in the Greek. Like he, he is, he is, he's not saying things in a nice, gentle tone. <laughs> uh, he's... He, he's absolutely yelling at him here. Um, and he's basically saying, may you, may you and your money die um, and receive death, right? And you thought, you, you were so foolish and blind that you thought you could, obtain, you could acquire the gift of God with bribes, with money. Um, uh, you have neither part nor lot in this matter, right? I mean, in other words, you, 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 will, you have nothing, you will, you will never get what you're desiring um, for your heart is not right before God. Um, sacrifices and offerings I care for not, but for a humble and contrite heart. Um, to paraphrase the words there, um, that's what's that's, <laughs> that's that's fundamentally what's going on here. Um, uh, he thought he could bribe his way into these powers when he wasn't right with God. Now, uh, actually, I'll continue the next sentence and then I'll pause. 
Verse 22, Repent therefore of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. Now, pause here. Right, having just read verses 21 and 22, particularly 20, 22, but 21 and 22. Di so again, it's why hermeneutics is so important. Didn't we get told in verse 13 that Simon the magician believed? Mm -hmm. Didn't we get told that he also bap was baptized? Mm -hmm. This is why when you proof text, which is where you just take a verse or a small collection of verses and just quote them without actually exegeting, mm -hmm. you will lead yourself into problems. You have to interpret words like you have in verse 13 in the light of not just the rest of the passage, but in, the, in comparison to every text that we have with regards to soteriology in this specific case. All right, soteriology, the, 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 the subject of salvation, okay? Uh, from soter, meaning safe. He's being told here that his heart is not right before God, i.e. he is not regenerate, right? he's not born again. He needs to repent of his wickedness. He needs to repent and actually repent because he hasn't repented. But yet we got told that he believed. So what's going on here? Arminians will have one particular perspective, but the historic reformed understanding, and we've been smart to the understanding of the church for quite a long time, right? but when you actually exegete this, more importantly, when you exegete this passage in its entirety and in the connection to the rest of scripture, you will realize that what we're dealing with here is what we just generally refer to in modern terms as a false convert, okay? He never actually believed. He never actually repented. He never actually put his trust in Christ. He was never regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit. First, before any of that ever occurred in the first, he was never given the gift of faith. He was never given the gift of repentance. He was never, none of this ever occurred. This needed to occur. But the wording that he used on a very broad surface level when he's giving this pretty quick description in verse 13 about even Simon believing and being baptized. What does it demonstrate? It demonstrates that the mere profession of faith, even coupled with the public act of baptism, doesn't somehow magically mean that that's true. It doesn't somehow mean that that's a, put a stamp on it, 100%, he's good to go. It doesn't mean that. Because you must believe in your heart. Yes. Not just True, and there's a more that's true, that's not untrue. There's also a more important layer to this. There's a profession with the mouth that, by all accounts, even probably to people around him, was genuine, yeah. was heartfelt. That, by any reasonable human metric in our own you know, in our own finite way, would have seemed legitimate. What was it not coupled with? Mm, hard, there's something more pragmatic. Works. Repentance. Mm. Right. Repentance and works, works of faith, the actual fruit of the Spirit. Okay. Now we're going to get into a really important balance, right? That is vital for Protestants to understand because we've gone off the rails so hardcore on this subject that I wouldn't even know where to begin. Obviously, a gigantic issue during the Reformation was the distinction, firstly the distinction, and then secondarily the balance between faith and works. Okay. The foundational doctrine of, of the Reformation was sola scriptura, and then springing forth from that, the foremost doctrine beyond sola scriptura, that the scriptures alone are the only infallible or God-breathed source, was that a sola fide, that faith alone is what brings justification, not faith plus works of the law or even faith plus works of faith. Mm. The pushback on that, is obviously in that immediate context by Roman Catholicism, it's also a point that Eastern Orthodoxy rejects as well, or stands against, is a rejection of the concept of sola fide, right? of faith alone being the definer or the metric of justification. But we're just talking about justification, not necessarily salvation as a whole, because again, we sometimes in our modern English parlance tend to use salvation and justification synonymously as if it's a one-time past event, right? Whereas the scriptures use what we in English from the Latin, justification, sanctification, glorification, 
or in other words, in the more common biblical language, was saved, are being saved, will be saved. Salvation is a much broader category, as a word salvation, is a much broader category than just, just justification, right? Only justification, okay? There is justification, there is sanctification, there is glorification, right? We are to pray to thank God that we have been saved. We are to ask him to save us and ask and pray that we will be saved, right? <laughs> it, it, exactly. I understand, but by virtue of the fact that, you know, I'm with you. It, all I'm trying to do is educate on how this has been understood, not just biblically, but historically. Look, I, I'm with you because the Greek speaks for itself. It's That's what I mean. Pretenses. What I'm saying is... Salvation is, yes. Your yes. words are challenging to just about every modern evangelical Protestant Christian. Yes, I understand that, yes. And that's... And that's Unfortunate, <laughs> um, but it is what it is. Um, is that why p- perhaps Paul says, "Work out your salvation with, with fear, fear and trembling"? Yeah, that's the words that I'm kind of touching on here. Right? Is that it's where sometimes it's where certain modern Protestants can go off the rails. It's where the Orthodox and certainly Roman Catholics have gone off the rails. Certainly, much very much, much more the Roman Catholics than the Eastern Orthodox. But either way, um, is the failure to distinguish these terms. Right, and to understand how they're being used. Justification is, by definition, a past event. Okay? Um, we know that by virtue of the fact, uh, two main reasons. One, it's used and employed in what's called the aorist tense, or just simply the past tense. It's then also done, again, the other major informant of how we understand that word, dikaiosune, right, in the Greek, justification, is that it's used, particularly by Paul, in what's called the passive <coughs> voice. Right? This is an important thing, because it'll come up. You can write this down if you want to. Greek has three different voices. Technically, there's a fourth, but it almost never comes up. There are three main voices. Right? What's called active, middle, and passive. What do those mean? Fortunately, they're very easy to understand. The active voice is kind of as the name suggests. It's something that you or the subject of the sentence is actively doing. Right? And it, so uh, let's take let's take the word throw. Right? An example of this would be, I throw the ball, throw. Or even if it was in the, even in the past, I throw, or I threw. Um, if it was past tense, like aorist tense, I threw the ball, okay? You're active, the, the subject, me in this case, is actively doing something. I threw the ball. Then there's the middle voice. Middle voice is something that is being done by the subject to themselves or to itself, right? So. I threw myself in the pool, right? I threw myself into the situation or whatever the kind of wording you would have, right? I threw myself into the midst of the battle, right? Whatever the context is. It's something that the subject does to themselves, right? I threw myself, so I, da, 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 myself. Then there's what's called the passive voice. I was thrown. I was thrown in jail. I was thrown out of the arena. I was thrown out of the church. I was, <laughs> I was thrown. I was whatever. Something was done to me. That's why it's passive. De Kaiosune, like you famously get in many places in Romans, right? About having been justified, right? Is in the aorist tense, so the past tense, and it's in the passive voice, which means by definition, justification, right? Regeneration, being born again, is not something that is done from the human will. It's not something which uh, I decided to follow Jesus. It's by definition, because it's in the passive voice, something that's done to us. The Greek speaks for This is why the languages are important, right? Because when you read the languages in their original context and actually read the, language, the original language as it is, as it was written by, in this case, Paul, it speaks for itself. It's in the passive voice, which means that regeneration and justification is something that God does to us. Not that he just invites us to, and we then make the decision. That's not what it's saying in the Greek. That's a whole lot of this more Yeah, I know, exactly. Um, the Holy Spirit mm. has chosen uh, words here very carefully. Yeah. Uh, it's, um, it's a good thing to examine Simon's belief. It mm. says Simon believed. Mm. Well, obviously Simon believed something. Yes, that's, that's clear. Yes, exactly. Yep. Obviously Simon believed to an extent. Mm-hmm. But sure. he didn't believe to the extent of faith. 
Correct. You didn't believe to the extent of repentance. Correct. That's the seminal point, yes. Because, isn't it, Jude tells us that the demons yeah, believe. Yeah, that's, that's what the next point was going to be. That's my next point. Yeah, exactly. And well, that's, what do the demons believe? Well, obviously they believe in the hierarchy in the spirit realm, that oh, yeah. God is at the top. Correct. They, they, believe that. they believe that Jesus is divine. They believe and that Jesus, yeah, they believe all that. Simon must have believed the very same thing because he was practicing the dark arts. Yep. And then he saw the Holy Spirit. He saw the Holy Spirit's uh, uh, power. The fruit of his power. Yep. And, and therefore believed immediately that there was a higher power to the magical arts that he was practicing for a lifetime. Yeah, exactly. So he believed that. That's what I'm saying, exactly. And what else did he believe? Uh, well, he would have believed on the name of Jesus Christ immediately. Yeah, yeah, he, he would have. He would have. That's what I'm saying. He would have. These words wouldn't make sense if he did not verbally assent in the presence of those people that Jesus was divine, that Jesus was etc. Although that's an interesting point that will come up after this about that particular belief. But yeah, the the, the, the fundamental point here is that the verbal assenting to the believing to use the, the Greek term that we get there from uh, pistuo right, or pisteo to to believe right or to have faith to have trust same thing um, is that that is part of it that's part of it the verbal assent and profession is but one part if that verbal profession if that faith that belief that, that the, from the Greek there is unaccompanied by works or by fruit of the spirit as we sometimes refer to them right? the evidence in other words the evidence that the spirit has regenerated the heart if it's absent of that and there's just the professed faith the faith is false it's not real the individual has not been born again. They have not been regenerated. Because if they were, that would be evidence by works of faith. Mm -hmm. That's the real big thing about the book of James. Okay? That's why initially, on the surface level, um, uh, for the first couple of years, Luther railed against James, didn't think it was scriptural, didn't want it in the canon. Um, because as he was trying to figure these things out and work with the original text, it's, on the surface level, it seemed to be saying exactly what Rome was saying. Okay? Um, especially in the way that Rome had interpreted it by that point for like a thousand years in a really concrete way, um, well, progressively, but either way. Um, certainly by that point in the, in the early 16th century, um, had a very particular definition of what James was saying, particularly in chapter 2, uh, faith, without, uh, faith without works is dead, for example. Um, and, and even James's words that we are saved by works is just picked up as a proof text Wrote quotation, no exegesis, no analysis, no legitimate attempt at hermeneutics, or sometimes there is, but no legitimate attempt at hermeneutics, certainly not biblical hermeneutics, and just wrote quotation, oh, see, James says you'll say, but I, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with Roman Catholics, and to a lesser degree, Eastern Orthodox, who have just quoted James 2, verse 24, whatever it is, 24, 28, somewhere in there, um, you know, uh, we are saved by works, and just, quote, just quoted it, just pure quotation, no exegesis, Nothing. No, actual engage, no, not even quotation in the broader context of what James even says in just chapter 2, let alone any of the other chapters. Just quotation. Because when you actually read the rest of that, and I'll say, again, this is why it's important to have long-form videos, because if you just clip what I'm about to say, you'll go, has he just converted to Roman Catholicism? Um, we are very much saved by works. Our faith is also dead if it doesn't have works, and we are saved by works. And if the video just cuts there, Daniel's abandoned Protestantism, he's moved to Roman Catholicism, oh my goodness, what's happening? No, no, pause. Why are we saved by works? Why is it that James uses that word? He literally says, we are saved by works. Because works of faith across the span of an individual, of a Christian's life, testify to and are the very evidence and proof of regenerated faith. Do you understand? Because what happens is this. The Spirit of God regenerates the dead heart. He converts the heart. That's what we call, refer to as being born again. Right? Born of the Spirit. Right? Spiritually born again. That's justification. The Spirit, same Spirit of God then continues to change through repentance and faith. The heart, i.e. the will of that individual Christian across their life, however long it may be from that point. Right? He makes them more holy, right? So he's purging sin, right? And by definition, increasing or improving holiness. That's what it word means, sanctification from the, the Latin from the Latin sanctus, meaning holy. And eventually, 
by virtue, not of that individual's own righteousness, for there is none, because all the way back at justification, at that point of regeneration, the righteousness of Christ is then accredited and was credited at that immediate point to that individual, right? That's what the author of Hebrews goes into ad infinitum. Again, that's why righteousness or justification, to Kaios is in the passive voice. It's something that's done to us. But when they die, they will then be glorified. They will be saved on account of the fact that before God, they are morally perfect. Their works save them. Yes. So we don't yes. go from day to day wondering if we're saved because he has convinced us by his sinning. Yep. And the works that God prepared before we were. Yes, exactly. The works are prepared before. The works he wants us to do. Yeah, that he's prepared beforehand for those who love him. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's, what, that's what Paul's saying there in, in Romans uh, 8 and in around verse 28. So when you think on it quite simply. Mm hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. It's, it's, the, it's the interesting paradox of Scripture. There's, there's yeah. simplicity yeah. on the surface of infinite complexity. Yeah. yeah. And, so, and so James is not being heretical when he says that faith without works is dead. He's very much correct. And in fact, that is the verse in which you do understand the concept of works saving us. It is not works in the meritorious sense of works of the law when you read the rest of... James chapter 2, you realize that. It's only if you blindly and rotely quote just that verse of you are saved by works and then apply your own predetermined understanding of what constitutes works to the passage and you have Roman Catholicism. You have Eastern Orthodoxy. That's the problem. Now, in fairness, Eastern Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism have two notably different understandings of what that means, so I want to be fair in that, but it's exemplified most atrociously in Roman Catholicism. Um, that's where the balance occurs. The reason why he's able, to, he is in Luke's here, he's able to use the term pistuo, right, or in its specific form. Let me get actually how he uses it. Verse 13. Where are we? Where's verse 13? There we go. Yeah, epistuo, right, Him, himself having believed, right, aorist tense. And active, right? So, aorist, past tense, active voice, meaning he be- he was the one doing it, right? So, he believed. Um, him believing that the Holy Spirit was indeed the Holy was indeed God. Him believing that the apostles of Christ were in fact the apostles of Christ. Him believing that the miracles were actually of God, right? Uh, him believing uh, that Jesus was indeed the Christ, was indeed the Kyrios, right? The Lord. Right? Oh. That's just one thing. That's not the definer of an individual having been regenerated by the Holy Spirit. The evidence of regeneration is works, works of faith, which are in conformity to the law. That's how you want to understand James chapter 2, because that's what James chapter 2 says. That's what it says when you read the rest of that chapter. That's why he says faith without works is dead, is as in dead, as in the faith is dead. It's dead. It's not real, in other words. It's, it's not active. It doesn't, it's, it's nothing. What we're witnessing here is dead faith, faith that is not actually alive, that is not real, genuine, born again. He was not born again here. Okay, that's the fundamental understanding of this passage because it's evidenced by the fact there is no fruit of the Spirit. That's how you understand this as a balance, right? Um, and, And so when you lose that, what you end up with is just the acceptance of any old person that just says, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, or oh yeah, I believe Jesus is God. That being smart, the very same author James says, oh, you, well, you, believe that, you believe that God's real, or you believe that Jesus is God? Oh, ha. oh, congratulations, sir. You are the most eminent theologian. I mean, even the demons believe that. That has uh, serious implications for things like altar calls. Uh, yeah, big time. Oh, yes, pray. yes. Yep, yep, yep. Um, I'm not saying that, that 150 years ago they didn't stay 
uh, after the revivals, they didn't stay believers. I think, by and large, they stay believers. Mm. Praise be to God. Mm. But uh, in this day and age, the Billy Graham Crusades, for example, that also has massive implications yeah. for, the, for those crusades. Because Correct. by his own confession, yep. Billy Graham said that half of them didn't continue. Yeah, and he actually ended up getting to the point where, if I'm remembering correctly, he even said at one point that he only thinks about five-ish percent of, of people who ever attended actually were born again. Who Billy Graham said this? Yeah. Um, and this is not, again, this is not a knock. It's not a knock at all. Uh, he's not saying, oh, Billy Graham wasn't a Christian. No, no, it's not, no one's saying that. No one's saying, no one's saying that, he, that he's not a Christian. No one's saying that he's... Mi- exactly, no, exactly what I'm saying. No, no one's saying that. No one's saying that he... he no one's saying that he didn't do good things. No one's saying that. No one's saying he didn't contribute to the events of the gospel. No one's saying that he didn't do those things. The issue, though, and, this, and any, it's important to do this because it, it, it's, it's important to the function of the church to just be honest about things, right? Mm-hmm. As, as the Crusades were going forth from city to city, what unfortunately ended up happening, by any reason, and this is not, this is not my own idea, there's been plenty of church historians that have now codified this, is you have, a ra- you have a big, gigantic rally in, let's go pick a random place, in, in St. Louis, Missouri, okay, in America. And 100,000 people attend, 200,000 people, 30, how many people named some bit, right? Um, 100,000 people attend, let's just say. Um, that or, the Billy Graham evangel- Evangelistic Organization, that, that entity that's done this, right, that entity then just, and that whole the proverbial fire trail of that event doesn't stay there. It, by definition, moves on. So then who, wh- what happens after the fact? What's the aftermath of that? Okay. Are there people who are converted? Sure. Where do they end up? Because the issue that occurred was, and I'm not saying that the Billy Graham Evangelistic uh, Association organization, whatever they call these days, didn't try to do this. They did. It um, just didn't work terribly well. Um, <laughs> those new born again Christians have to go somewhere. Uh, where? Where? Where are they going? Where? Them, if you're Roman Catholic, go back to the Roman Catholic Church. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's not true. Maybe, said that. Maybe some of these counselors might. Some of them may have. Um, I the. It's my understanding that Billy Graham himself said that. Said that. He's on route. Whether or not he said that specific way, I'm, so I can't confirm whether he did or did not that I'm the metric. What I, what I will say, though, is this, is that, is that, and this is not meant to be some indictment, by the way, I'm just explaining history, is that mm. certainly by the, in the latter years of his life, he did very, on more than one occasion, unfortunately, seem to indicate that, yes, there are Christians in Roman Catholicism, yes, there, are Christ, yeah. there are Christians in Eastern Orthodoxy, there well, are Christians... Right. I think, I think, oh, no, I think, I think he can be right for sure. The issue, though, is that. No, exactly. That's one. That's one thing. The other, the other main issue was the fact that in his last couple of years, he, again, on more than one occasion, indicated that there are Christians outside of Christianity. Or believe, believers, I think, is the word specifically used. Um, I, don't, I, I would need to go back and get the exact wording, but that he def- definitively and categorically said that more than once that there are those who are outside of Christianity who will be in heaven one day. That becomes really problematic. Um, yeah, you would. Yeah, at, at best you would need to. At best you would need to pass that out as to what on earth that means, uh, and that's me being super generous because in reality it's almost unjustifiable. But yeah, get back to the point. Um, the issue here fundamentally is that Simon the magician does not have the evidence or the fruits of the spirit. Okay, that is why his faith, his pistio, his belief, right is by definition dead, it's not real, it's just the verbal assent, even strongly held, strongly believed, a lot of emotion, doesn't matter, all those things can be true, but all you're doing is saying words, and without being smart, all you're doing is, yes, I believe that Jesus is the king of kings. Cool. <laughs> it's like the most fundamental baseline... Uh, yeah. She became, uh, um, she was well, doing the works that God had prepared. Mm-hmm. She went to tell the whole village. Yeah, and, and moved, it, moved immediately into that kind of adventure. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and, and Simon, he just thought about money. Yeah, thought about money and power more importantly. Money yeah. 
power, partic power particularly. This was about power. Um, this is about power and by extension influence and control and all sorts of things like that that kind of spring forth from power. Um, again, because like literally like notice the symbol saying, give me this power also so that anyone upon whom, I, anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So it's power and not just in the ethereal sense, but actually the pragmatic power of influential power mm -hmm. of anyone that I lay my hands on <laughs> will receive the Holy Spirit. So that I'm the one that can now be I'm, I'm now the one that will, in his mind, I'm now the one that will determine and control whether this person gets saved or not. Whether this person becomes, like, gets Christian or not, right? The Samaritan woman very is a very important example because uh, she had the elements that are lacking mm. here. Jesus convicted her of sin. Yes, she correct. She accepted her sinfulness. That's right. And she repented of it. There and then, otherwise she would She was definitely sealed by the Spirit. She yes. knew yes. she was living in error. Yeah. She'd already had... had that requ it required, in terms of the Spirit, it required, it required something beyond Pentecost, because yeah. again, that's the whole distinction between normative and narrative, is that you see people in the Gospels who, by any general definition, believe, to use the word here, yet we're told that the Spirit didn't actually come to Pentecost. Also, what happened? Then again, you have to read narrative and distinguish that from normative. You are talking about specific events at a specific time, at a very unique time. The transition between the old and new covenant, where things were done specifically for specific reasons. Okay, so the centurion, right, who is the first one to ever be called a believer in Christ, right, who who has his uh, has his servant, uh, his boy servant, uh, healed, right, and 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 Jesus, literally, the wording is, he's amazed, like he's shocked, like he's gobsmacked by the fact by the fact that this. Roman warrior believes that he is God in the flesh, and yet you've got this entire horde of God's people who he knows full well hate him and are going to kill him. <laughs> That's the distinction. Um, and, and so the belief, right, is not unimportant. I don't want to make sure, I don't want to say it's unimportant, it 100% is. But the belief is only validated and proven genuine by works of faith, by works, by fruits of the Spirit, right? It's the consistent testimony of the Scriptures. Evidence. Yes. Yeah, yeah evidence. Yeah, evidence, fruits of the Spirit. Same, same, have, yes, exactly. It's evidence that regeneration is going to take it because they're, we're told explicitly and expressly that there will be evidence. Um, you know, I say, I say to people that I that I minister to in council who are having doubts about, yeah, am I really saved or am I? Have you, have you confessed your sins to God? Have you repented of your sins? Uh, do you do this, 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 that, 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 like just broad category things? Yes, yes, yes. Do you desire to obey God? Yes. Do you desire to love him? Yes. Okay. This is all fruit of the spirit. Mm -hmm. So what does this mean? It means that you have the, there is discernible evidence that you are born again, right? That, you are, that God has regenerated your heart, right? Your will, your spirit, and it's evidenced, okay? It's not just merely the profession, it's actually evidenced. Not just in the pragmatic sense, although that's one category, but also in terms of the desires of the heart. Again, the, the unregenerate heart doesn't desire to obey, <laughs> obey God's law, <laughs> um, right? Um, and, so I, and, and so I always point out to people, and then... So then what's the fundamental issue? Okay, so why are you having struggles with assurance? Because you're looking far too, there's many reasons, but fundamentally they all spring forth from the fact that you are looking far too much towards your emotions and how you're feeling about it versus what God has already told you he already has done. Right? Has you, oh, has, yeah. Is this all that tells us that the conscience convicts the believer? Yeah, correct. Yeah. yeah. The conscience convicts. If, if you have any doubts, look at your conscience. Yeah, your exactly. That's the point I'm trying to point to. And so, and so, and so, if there's if there's issues of, of assurance and other such things, um, is is it? Oh, you're having a lack of faith. Mm, that would be, need to be passed out. What's meant by that? But it can be entirely to do with the issues of the fact that you're looking far too more. Far, you're putting. You're looking towards your emotions for confidence, versus looking towards the only immutable and unchangeable source from which you can draw confidence, right? Um, because your emotions, depending on the people, depending on the gender, just a roller coaster. Ebb and flow, right? Great mountain peaks, disastrous valley falls, <laughs> right? And that goes for people based on their personalities, it goes for the difference between men and women, it goes for a thousand different factors, right? 
Um, so looking to your emotions for confidence as to whether or not you are in Christ or whether or not you are saved or, whether or thousand, whatever wording the individual happens to use is not the source. Can't be the source. They can't be the source. You're, you're, in for, you're in for a rough ride if you're trying to place it in there. And so that may be an issue of stop looking towards your emotions and look towards something far better than your emotions. That Jesus has already promised you, my work is finished. It's approved by God. It's, like it's, been, it's been successful. It hasn't been rejected. It's been approved by virtue of the fact that I was raised from the dead. That showed that, showed that it was successful. We're explicitly told that the resurrection proved that the payment on the cross had actually achieved what it set out to achieve. We're expressly told that by Paul. And that he has now ascended and sits at the right hand of God in all power and majesty and dominion. And makes intercession for us continually. We've got a wonderful analogy in, um, in the words of Jesus. Jesus said, my miracles are to demonstrate, to prove mm-hmm. to the eyes and the ears that I am who I am. Who yes. I am yeah. I'm God. We have the same proofs. Mm-hmm. If we examine our lives mm-hmm. and we compare our lives today as believers to the period where we were unbelievers, yeah. or if you were a believer as a child. No, no, people were raised in Christian households, yeah, but especially if we come from a non Christian household, for sure. Yeah. Every day Absolutely. That the Spirit has effected change. Yes. Biblical change. Yeah. Not just change on a humanistic level. No, 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 no. You know, change. Season, the change, that change that cannot be understood from a purely uh, psycho-behavioural, analytic kind of perspective, yes. There are our proofs, just like Jesus' sign of miracles were proof of his divinity. Yes. Yes, correct, and that's the, test, and that's the fundamental point, exactly right, is that this, this, those signs were testifying to the validity and the verity of the claim, I am God. What's the point? And namely the, the apostles. That's the fundamental issue of distinguishing between normative and narrative. If you read and go, well, they did miracles, that must mean that I can do it too. No, you have the record of that having been done because that's what they were for. So and now, for us, any point across that 2,000 year period, doesn't matter if it's now, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 1,500, at any point, what was the validity that Jesus was God? Miracles. Where do we find that? Me? No. Right here. You have it here. You have it recorded for you. There is no theological reason at any possible level why apostolic gifts, right? I when I say, again, I've made this distinction before, I'll make it again. This is, not, this is not a purely naturalistic claim that, oh, healing never happens. That, that, that's not the point. That's not the point at all. The point is the, the miraculous gifts as the scriptures present them, right? That the apostles had, that the, early, that the Christians in those first couple of decades had. Right, to one degree or another, that the miraculous or charismatic gifts is where that word comes from. Uh, charismatic is evidence for us here, and is told for us here. There is no theological reason whatsoever that can actually be passed out consistently as to why those gifts must have continued when you have the record of them having occurred in black and white. Right. So the argument that oh we need the miraculous gifts today, speaking in tongues and etc. etc. etc to testify to the message, you already have the miraculous gifts that have already testified to the message. It doesn't actually connect mm. as to why you would some, there'd be a theological necessity to even have them in the first place today. Before you even begin to actually talk about what the scriptures actually say about them, it doesn't even break through the threshold of why on earth they would be needed today in the first place. Does that make sense, what I'm trying to distinguish there? It embraces some very disturbing elements about why there are, why there are certain believers. I didn't say converted Christians. I, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, those who profess. Those who profess. Yeah. Uh, you know why is it that so many men and women in the USA and uh, UK and Australia demand these um, modern day apostolic gifts? Yeah, can I? Uh, I I had that experience. Yeah. As you know. Yeah, yeah, got you. And I went to a certain church and. They hands on and speaking mm. time, and it frightened me so much. I, I just left, and I brought Lauren, and thankfully she found here. Yeah. Um, and I spoke to my pastor up at Islington, yep. at Newcastle, and he just said, "No, just 
stay away, just yeah. stay away. Yeah, exactly. Was I right in doing that? Or? Yes, yes, yeah. for, yes, fundamentally, absolutely. Yeah, cause yeah, because it's not, yeah, I just had this overwhelming fear of, this is not right, this is, yeah. I've got to get away from Yeah, this. correct, and there's countless people, and what's happening now, fortunately, is that what's well, stream in, stream out, you've got those who are joining in big numbers, but there are also big numbers that are leaving. Um, uh, so, so the charismatic movement, it's, a, it's hit a bit of a stasis now, but it, it's grown significantly over the decades. But it's only, it's certainly the last five to 10 years, it's really grown only by virtue of just net balance because a bomb load of people have come in, but a bomb load of people have gone out, right? So you end up looking like, oh, it's growing and growing, but how is it actually growing on a net basis of how many inverse, how many out? But anyway, um, because- When you're demanding those gifts- Correct. Demanding them. Oh, it is you're categorically, yeah. Where is your humility? That's what I mean. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying to you. Because the, cause what happens is, is that the, these miraculous gifts of tongues, which are never practiced according to the scriptures in the first place, of prophecy, which is never practiced according to the scriptures in the first place, of healing, which is never practiced. The way that they commonly get practice of tongues, you will never, ever, and if someone wants to point me to an example, I'd love to see it because I've never in my life seen it. Every single possible example of someone in a charismatic church speaking tongues is this mystical angelic language. You will never find someone who doesn't know a lick of Japanese all of a sudden just break out into Japanese. Never. You'll find it based on, I think it's 1 Corinthians 2, uh, I'm going to say 12 or 13, somewhere in there. Um, it's the introductory verse. If, if, I, if I speak in the, in the tongues of angels but have not love, and that's the justification for supposed angelic tongues. Uh, uh, one single sentence where Paul says, if I speak in the tongues of angels but have not love, I'm like a clanging cymbal or a banging gong. As if he's not so clearly and evidently speaking in hyperbole, because the very next sentence he says, if I have the faith that can move mountains but have not love. Do we have any record of Paul like moving Mount Tejetos in, in the Peloponnese or something like that? Do we have any, <laughs> any evidence of him moving the path or not? Like none of that. He's speaking in hyperbole. And that's the one sentence justification for, what, for every account of charismatic tongues you've ever heard in your life. Because that's where you get to, when you don't bother. When you, when you do bother, but when you don't exegete the scriptures accurately, when you don't use hermeneutics properly, and you just, abu you just literally just take a meat grinder to suit your first Yeah, well, we don't want to take a sledgehammer to the charismatics. But, um, no, it's not meant to be that. The Simon, Simon the Magician is a very good example for the charismatics to, to determine because mm. um, we, we agree that he was interested in money, but beyond the money, he was interested in the the, the, the power, the yes. power and control, yeah. Status. status, yeah, everything that comes along with that. And, and when we look at We're told about that because that's exactly what he was. But this, this, you think you think he was? You think this guy shied away from this man is the power of God that is called great? <laughs> you think he shied away from that? He was practically worshipped as a god, practically. When we examine the, the modern church, and Jesus said regarding a certain church, the later same church. You are lukewarm. Why, why was the church lukewarm? Because mm. he was patting itself on the back saying, how comfy I am. Correct, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and Jesus there was picking up on a, on, he did this in all, the, all, the, all seven churches, but he, in particular in Laodicea, he picked up on a, on a very familiar um, image to them. Laodicea in the, in the Valley of the Lycus in modern day Turkey uh, has multiple, has hot springs in that area, that, also in Hierapolis, which is across the valley from them. Um, uh, which a number of uh, hot springs on these tiers down the mountains, very beautiful. Um, and you would have streams and rivers from the hot springs as well as the natural just cold streams that would eventually merge and run through Laodicea. So it's a very familiar image to them mm -hmm. um, of this water that is, both, that is neither hot nor cold, as in it's not decisively this or that, it's just lukewarm, yeah. And, and the Lord preferred a cold believer might say, really? Well, that's what he said. I, I would that you were hot or cold. So what's a, what's a cold believer? What's a cold church? Who's running to the church? What's a cold church? I won't answer that. I'm take, I'm take, I'm, yeah, true. I'm going to take one step further. I'll take, a, I'll take it one step further too, because this is also an implication that can be drawn from that, maybe even the primary, but either way. Um, I would prefer the primary, the primary implication, because that's not necessarily untrue, but certainly the primary implication there between hot and cold is actually between 
light and dark. Definitive Christian or definitive not Christian. He's, he really, he really is saying, I would, prefer, I would prefer you to be a bona fide enemy of God because yes. at least you're just being honest. Yes. Yeah. Remember, he said in I and see where the, one of the persons says, uh, you're hot, you're hot, you're cold, you're cold, as the person mm. approaches yeah, yeah, yeah. the other. <laughs> is, it, is it hide and seek? Yeah, it's, it's, oh, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, yeah. it's a version of it. Yeah, 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 version, yeah. Of high, version of hide and seek. Yeah. Right, I liken that to, say, Simon the Magician. He's yeah. effectively a Satan. Um, yep. Or yeah. let's take other Satanists, let's not take Simon. No, but magician, a magician generally is going to be, yeah, I'm yeah. with you. Let's take a Satanist. He's, um, he's cold, but yep. he's looking. He's mm-hmm. looking for something. They've got a religion. It's called oh, Satan. yeah. Satanism. It's their religion. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, now they're seeking, but they're seeking in a you know, cold area. Of yeah, exactly, life. yeah. So the Lord prefers that. That's my point. Yes, Why? that's the because fundamental point of that passage. Yes. Yeah, and they're seeking, and, and and they're decisively something. They're actually being. They actually have consistency and integrity. I've pointed to that before. I don't remember when it was. I think it was in our series, Christ or Chaos. But I pointed it out other times. The atheist who I have had the most respect for in my life, bar absolutely none, it's not even close, was a a Enlightenment era figure by the name of Marquis de Sade. Um, Marquis de Sade is a French name, right? the, the, Mar- the Marquis of Sade, um, was what was referred to, he was among a group called the Libertines. Right? So this is 300 years ago, uh, roughly speaking, 400 years ago. Um, the Libertines were, were atheistic or deistic um, uh, Enlightenment era figures in Europe, particularly France, uh, but also to a lesser degree England and Germany. Um, who rejected God, rejected Christianity, rejected the Bible, rejected the church, rejected everything involved in that, right? Um, and who, consistent with their atheism, right, that there is no God, um, upheld the principle that if there is no God, there is no law, capital L, like there is no holy law, there is no law of God. Mm-hmm. There is no God, there is no law, there is no law. By definition, there is no morality. There is no morality, there is no moral constraints. Ergo, free reign. Do what thou wilt. Libertine, yeah, libertine from the French word, obviously, to the Latin libere, meaning liberty, which is <coughs> liberty. Yes, do what thou wilt. You do what they will, except even, except even, except the Church of Satan doesn't even take it that far. What's ironic is they don't, they, they don't go as far as the Libertines. The Libertines were consistent atheists. What they did is they used that very Socratic method of getting to the conclusion that if there is no God, da, 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 there is no such thing as morality, there is no such thing as moral constraints, right? It's pure animalic survival of the fittest. Yep, right, exactly. Um, so, so the Libertines, and the most famous which being Marquis de Sade. Uh, yeah, if you can imagine it, if you can imagine the most horrific, moral, morally egregious and evil acts, he did it. There is no limit to what you can imagine and what he did or didn't do. Do you understand? Um, not that I recommend you read it. I don't. Uh, I, only rec- I would only recommend. I'd recommend it for. I'd only recommend it for the for mature Christians or for those who have a specific apologetic reason for doing it. Um, his, his most famous work was called 120 Days in Sodom." Um, uh, which was a, an account of, of him and other libertines kidnapping teenage girls um, and boys and for 120 days, um, so another four months, um, doing anything you can possibly imagine to them. And I'll let your imagination go. Um, there is no limit. Um, and but what, So you might say, why on earth does a Christian pastor respect Marquis de Sade? I respect him, and I respect him more than any atheist that's ever lived, only by virtue of the fact and because of the fact that he consistently applied his atheism to its logical conclusions. The logical conclusions of atheism is horrific evil, because there is no God, ergo there is no law, ergo there is no morality, ergo I can do what I want. Except that Romans 1 convicts him before he even gets to his own personal... Ethos. True. Because having known Until, the true God, correct, yes. God. Oh, exactly, yes. Until he then suppresses, continues to suppress the truth in unrighteousness, right? Um, to the point where he just becomes numb to it. Um, this is this is how it works, unfortunately. Um, I'll mention it here before I briefly circle back to finish this off, because there's only one last little bit here um, of a point worth making. Um, uh, has anyone heard of Jeffrey Dahmer? Mm. You have, yes. Jeffrey Dahmer, um, otherwise known as the Milwaukee Monster, um, serial killer in the United States in the late 80s, early 90s, 
Um, uh, I think 17 was the eventual number, 17 boys um, of varying ages in their teenage and into their 20s and early 30s, um, kidnapped, drugged, uh, tortured, raped, uh, and eight, 17 boys. Um, so rapist, serial killer, cannibal. Um, by all legitimate accounts, and I very rarely say this because a lot of them are like, hmm, okay. Um, but by all genuine accounts, um, in, in prison, uh, did legitimately convert uh, to Christ. And there was evidence of that. It wasn't just mere profession. There was legitimate evidence of faith. There was legitimate evidence of works, even in the prison. Um, uh, the pastor who ministered to him and then baptised was, was sound. Um, he was baptised in, in the prison um, and then accepted basically the fact that I will almost certainly be killed in here. Um, I deserve it for what I did. Um, but, but I placed my only trust and hope for salvation in Christ. Um, and by all reasonable legitimate accounts, a, a lot of prison conversions are largely mm, okay, a bit iffy. Um, this is not one of them. Um, because that is the power, and I would legitimately say, I would, with, without knowing everything, that I would highly suspect that we will see Jeffrey Dahmer in heaven one day. Now, to a lot of people, you go, how can Earth? Mm. 17, <laughs> like a serial killer, one of the worst serial killers in American history. Da, da, da. Because that's the power of God unto mm. salvation. And what it does is that when people rail against it, they don't like the fact that God would even offer salvation and forgiveness to a man who raped, murdered, and ate 17 people. Mm. <laughs> they don't like that because how, how could God possibly dare to, how could God dare to forgive such a person? Mm. Why? He can only forgive someone nice like me. <laughs> yes, it's not. <laughs> that point of you must die and be born again. Correct. He actually died. Yep. To that. Yes. And God Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. And this is not, again, I'm not a mind reader. I'm not, I don't have, I, this is a well above my pay grade. I'm not telling you, I, by all legitimate evidence, I would, I would reasonably argue, and I don't with a lot of prison conversions, I don't, just because there's not, there's the words, but not the actions, um, that at least can reason. But in Dharma's case, there was such a radical shift in the way in which he now was and behaved and thought and everything else that had died in that, very difficult to explain that outside of being born again. Mm. But what Dharma did was, guess what he credited with, again, modern psychology and modern psychoanalytics and behavioral analysis, serial killers and murderers and rapists, anyone who does horrible things is, well, it's, it's, you know, it's because of you know, it's to get economic reasons and they lived in poverty or it's because they were, it's because they were abused as a child and well, it's because they were, they, you know, what's it, were they genetically born this way or they influenced by the, a thousand different things that are not conclusions that just lead you to the simple answer of, well, how about just sin? Um, can economics, can, can being in poverty impact it? Sure. Can being abused as a child impact it? Sure. Those things can. At the end of the day, it's because you're a human being who's fallen and has a sinful nature and you act upon that sin. And that's exactly what Jeffrey Dahmer said. Like Jeffrey Dahmer said, post-conversion, he said, he didn't play it off with, oh, you know, like it's just, you know, genetics and, you know, and my psychologist has said that. No, no. Uh, no, um, uh, no, I became an atheist. And then once I was an atheist, I realized that there was no God. And, and when there was no God, there was no law and no morality. And so therefore, uh, I could do what I want. And that's what he did. That's what he did. <laughs> that's the, because that's a logical conclusion to atheism. Mm. Because that's what, you understand, that's a logical conclusion. Yeah, that's a logical conclusion to atheism. I can do what I want. And so we, and so we did. And, and, and that terrifies most atheists because the only reason they don't do that is because they steal from us. Because they borrow our stuff, mm. right? And every atheist who wants to argue that there is no God will turn around and, 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 will turn around and call the police if you punch them in the face and steal their wallet. Mm. Why? What's, what's wrong about that? Wrong according to what? You don't complain when the lion, you know, kills the hyena on the Serengeti. Yeah, you don't complain about it. So what were you doing? Well, it's because you borrow from this. Because you can't. You, you, you still. You've had the blessing of being raised in the Christian culture and context that just seems like normal to you. One final point that's worth saying here, um, and it's very brief. Uh, fortunately, in verse we get this in verse uh, twenty-three and twenty-four. Um, 
this is Peter continuing, for I see that you are in the gall uh, or the, the bile. Uh, it's literally referring to like bile as in like the like acidic like fluid that comes from the liver, right? Bile. Um, you are the bile, so that you are in the bile of bitterness and the, in the bond of iniquity. This is Paul, uh, Paul not quite, this is Peter, <laughs> Paul not yet, Peter, uh, using wording going back to the Old Testament. Um, the, the, the gall or the bile of bitterness, the root of bitterness. Um, you see it come up in other texts. Uh, you see it come up, for example, in, in Deuteronomy. It's also then quoted in, um, mm -hmm. in Hebrews, I believe, somewhere like 11 or 12. Yeah, 12 rings a bell. Um, and so, yeah, probably is 12. Uh, it's certainly in there. Um, and root of bitterness, right, or the gall of it, you can get it in different ways in the Hebrew and the Greek, but the root of bitterness is used to describe this false teaching, basically, heresy, right? As, as bitter and poisonous, right? Because that's what heresy, right? Or, her or false teaching, right? I'm using those terms interchangeably here. That's what heresy is. It is poison to the church. It's poison. And, and the job of God's ministers is, among other things, first and foremost, to, to cut that out of the root and to, and to pull the roots of heresy and false teaching out. Um, the most common descriptors that are given to, to men in my position is twofold. I have a number of descriptors, but the, the most commonly used, feed the flock, protect the flock. Mm -hmm. feed, feed and protect, either way. Right? Feed and protect. That's why the imagery of shepherding, right? point men in the Greek, um, which is a, a verb. It's, I know we call our leaders pastors in Baptist circles. It's, pastor as a term is used as a verb, not so much a title. But anyway, um, the main it's it, point men in the Greek, pastor or to shepherd is used in a verbal sense as something you do. The more common descriptor in terms of title or office is that term episkopos, right? From which we get bishop in transliteration or, or, or overseer um, or guardian. What it means is to overlook, right? Like a, like a sniper on the battlefield who's overlooking his troops, looking for the enemies, right? A guardian, right? Feed the flock, protect the flock. The protection is just as important a job as it is feeding, right? Feeding and teaching and nurturing and growing and improving, you know, uh, helping along the way in sanctification, all those kinds of things are important, 100%. But a, a, an integral component of that is the protection, right? My, my job and Michael's job, as much as feeding, is also protecting, is also mm -hmm. keeping and safeguarding from heresy, from false teaching, from those who are seeking to influence the church in negative ways, a thousand different things along those lines. That's just as much an important element. And mm -hmm. that second element is, a, is what's been lacking. Um, uh, you can argue to one degree or another how much feeding has been going on, because it has been, but also sometimes hasn't, but the protection element is really what has been lacking in a lot of places in recent decades. Um, mm -hmm. Because when you don't protect, you actually ironically don't end up feeding properly. Mm -hmm. um, because if you're not protecting them against doctrine and false teaching, uh, sorry, false doctrine and, and heresies, right? Well, you're not safeguarding against that, so then what do you end up teaching them? That's part of the feeding. You know what I mean? Those kind of things. Um, and so we're well, speaking about root and bitterness. He, Peter here is doing his job, not just as an apostle, but as an elder of the church, which is what he is, as a bishop of the church. He is protecting the church, the newly established church in Samaria. He's protecting the church by rooting out, using that term, the root of bitterness from the Old Testament language, right? Heresy, that poison which will corrode and corrupt the church. That's what he's doing here. Um, and, and, and the little cherry on top is Simon's clear evidence, the fact that he doesn't, hasn't repented and that he isn't repenting. Um, even though it seems nice on the surface, right? Simon answered in verse 24, pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you've said may come upon me. Notice his word is not, goodness, Peter, you are absolutely right. I'm in tears, I'm heartbroken, I repent, I've won't repent. No, none of that. Boy, Peter, hopefully none of this bad stuff happens to me. Yeah, that's <laughs> the problem, and so that's where the conclusion leaves us, right? And so now when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel to many villages in, of the Samaritans, verse 25. And so this is why, to leave you with the final tidbit, um, Simon the magician, who we have zero evidence, this is the last we hear of him in the New Testament. This is it. We don't hear anything more of him of Simon the Magician. Have Never. Yeah. And not only did not repent, is that by every account, by the accounts of the early church fathers, he's the founder of Gnosticism. Mm. He's the founder of the Gnostic cult. Right? So the Gnostic cult was the first major enemy along with the Judaizers. Right? 
Um, uh, so the Judaizers, which were working primarily and heavily in Galatia, which is why Paul spent a lot of time writing against the Judaizers and the, Ju the Judaizing heretics, right? Um, uh, uh, Jews who were, like ethnic Jews, who were trying to teach the Gentiles that they had to become Jews first before becoming Christians. So they had to become Jews first, get circumcised, da 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 da, da ritually clean, everything else associated with that. They had to become Jews first before becoming Christians. So it was like Christian via Judaism, right? Explicit heresy, according to Paul in, Galat in Galatians. Um, Philippians spend so much time talking about Christology and the, per like the nature of Christ because the Gnostic cult had taken early roots in Philippi. That's why the first two chapters are so heavy on Christology. Okay? Gnosticism, very complex, but fundamentally taught that esoteric and secret knowledge was able to be acquired of God. Um, and their fundamental beliefs about Christ was that Jesus was only divine, not human. Um, uh, and so because they, they were fusing mystical, magical, occultic, occultism with Greek philosophy with Christianity and the byproduct of that was Jesus is only divine, not human, right? That's the Greek philosophy, philosophical element, the Platonistic element, coupled with the magical and mystical occultic element of secret knowledge and knowledge that can only be revealed by going through the different rituals and rites and all the things that you see in, in modern cults like Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so Simon the Magician is commonly upheld by, the, by many of the early church fathers, Irenaeus, Ignatius, um, Hippolytus, um, et cetera, et cetera, as having been um, the founder of Gnosticism. Wow. You can be little gods. Correct. Yes. Because he himself was referred to as those terms. Um, so Simon the Magician is held up traditionally as having been the founder of Gnosticism, and there's reasonable evidence that he was. So this becomes the number one arch enemy of the church in the first century. It's telling that he asks in uh, verse 24, yep. he asks Peter, mm -hmm. right now, ask the Lord, pray for me. Yeah. And very telling, there's no response to him. They ignore him, they walk away. Yeah, they don't see yeah. They walk away. They walk away. Yeah, they, they, don't, they don't see him. They lead to perdition. Mm -hmm. Correct, mm -hmm. yes. They don't cast their pearls before swine. They don't give that which is holy to the dogs. Uh, they realise they're dealing with concrete here, not with fertile soil. And so you don't cast pearls, holy things, before swine, unclean, unclean pigs, mm. right? That which is unholy, that which is dog, that, that, that the image, right? Or particularly in this Samaritan context, seeing as they'll commonly refer to as dogs, don't give that which is holy to dogs. <laughs> That's what that means, literally and figuratively. Um, and so they recognise this is an enemy and walk away. The apostles. That's what that's what Luke's uh, that's what Luke's identifying here is that when the when when Simon's Simon retorts that way, the apostles just yeah just walk away. Um, you have to work that into your theology of how evangelism should occur too. Um, uh, yeah, that, that in, yeah, there's an important implication there. Yeah, so that's that. So that finishes up this morning's um, fascinating story that has a lot of that that has implications for obviously as you can see a variety of different subjects. Um, and so next, and so next lesson, we'll, we'll finish off the chapter from verse 26 through to 40, um, regarding Philip and this figure we know as the Ethiopian eunuch. So.